2020 and COVID really opened our eyes to the fact that a global pandemic is really a global problem and, and therefore it needs a global solution. So I was always interested in how things work. So how the human body works, how cells work. And so I was drawn to the sciences and I studied the interaction between parasites and the immune system, how they live together. I was really enjoying my work in academia. So I stayed on at Imperial College for 10 years. I moved into industry for a few years to support um, new drug development and, and antibodies. But again, that still was too far away from people. And, and then I looked at the Wellcome Trust. And this is really where society and science come together and it was absolutely the right home for me. So I started at Wellcome in June 2014 and that was in the midst of the West African Ebola outbreak. The process to develop vaccines is, is very long, it normally takes 10 years and so there had been some work at an early stage in the lab to understand and to, to develop um, a vaccine for Ebola but it hadn't got to the stage where it had been, been tested for safety in people. I think six weeks after I started we at Wellcome decided to put a call out for clinical trials to assess vaccines and therapeutics treatments that would impact the current outbreak. We had to assess the safety of the vaccines and only once we had the safety could we then move on to understanding if the vaccines could protect. And you don't need to do the safety assessments in an outbreak, you can do that at any time. So it delayed the time that we could assess for protection, which potentially costs lives. But the one good thing about this whole process was there were many high level reviews that were done um, following the Ebola outbreak on how this can be done better, what's more effective. The WHO reorganized itself. They set up um, a more effective way to respond to outbreaks. They also incorporated research in the outbreak response, which is critical. And the second big piece um, to ensure that we never get into the situation again that we have vaccines, but they haven't been safety tested, was the development of the organization CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. And, and its mission is to develop vaccines where there's market failure, to develop vaccines for those priority pathogens, those emerging infectious diseases, and disease X, the unknown. The Wellcome Global Monitor showed a couple of years ago that low-income countries in general had a higher confidence and trust in the safety of vaccines than, than high-income countries, which um, stood out as, as one of the findings. And you know, the obvious question is, why is this? Why, why would it be that, that high-income countries generally have less lower confidence and trust in, in vaccines? And my, my interpretation would be that we in high-income countries are so fortunate to have vaccines that we have throughout our childhood for polio, measles, diphtheria. We don't see the disease, so we don't, we don't see it and we don't recognise it as, as being so devastating and therefore don't understand how valuable these vaccines are. In the past two weeks, the number of cases of COVID-19 outside China has increased 13-fold. And, and then um, COVID comes along and reminds us all in 2020 of how devastating and how powerful infectious diseases are. They, they impact our communities, they impact and have devastating effects on, on our economies. But also the flip side of that is we, are, we also understand and are reminded the power of vaccines and human innovation to develop those vaccines, um, to repair those communities and to get our economies back on track. What was seen in, in COVID, what was seen in 2020 was development of a vaccine within a year. That is unprecedented, a word that's been overused, um, but it really is. There are many reasons why we were able to move so quickly as a global vaccine community. Firstly, we had certain systems in place. Organisations like CEPI, who were already working on coronaviruses such as MERS and Disease X, and they could pivot their programmes relatively quickly. We also thought differently about how you conduct a clinical trial. So a normal process involves a preclinical stage, phase one clinical trials that are safety, phase two that look at the different doses of vaccines, and phase three that look at whether the vaccine can protect. What was done in 2020 for COVID was in parallel. Manufacturing was started um, very, very early on at the same time as the clinical studies, at risk, at financial risk, and that's not been done before. 
There are many silver linings and many positives that have come out of the COVID pandemic. We've got the mRNA vaccines validated now, and that's going to potentially open up a whole new era of, of vaccinology. I think it also has opened our eyes to what, what we call vaccine nationalism and equitable access of vaccines and why it's so important. For a global pandemic, you need a global solution, and it's really pushed us to, to think about how we can work more closely together. But the, the one that always um, that, that has stood out for me in COVID, but also in previous pandemics, is people's willingness to just try their hardest, to club together and, and really try and make a difference. And, and this I've really seen with the clinical studies, with the researchers, industry, policy makers, and the amazing volunteers that there are, those healthcare workers who are making this happen. And that's always kind of the, the guiding light for me. COVID is really the first global pandemic that any of us have lived through. And, and while historically we have seen um, what's called a panic and neglect cycle um, when it comes to epidemics, and, and what I mean by that is when you're in the moment of an epidemic, all guns blazing, trying to solve the solution, but when it's calmed down, when it's gone away, your attention is diverted elsewhere. But for, for COVID and, and this global pandemic, I, I'm already seeing um, the preparedness and, and the discussions around preparedness for the future so that we can detect viruses and bacteria. So we've got the tools ready and poised to go. So we're that bit closer, we're that bit more prepared and we're looking out for the next pandemic because with climate change and, and what we're seeing, epidemics and pandemics are only gonna be more and more um, regular and, and, and in our lives.